Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our master class at the Tradewise Gibraltar Chess Festival. Uh, I'm very happy to have with us today, giving us a lesson and interacting with us, Grandmaster Marujan Akobian. Hi, Kanya. <laughs> Hi. I'm glad to be here, and uh, uh, I prepared this game to go over. Right. Yeah. Now, Var, before we get into the game, tell us uh, why you chose this game and um, why do you like it so much that you're going to show it tonight? Well, I think it's my best game of this tournament, you know, from the ones I played. I've had a lot of long games, you know, last couple of games was kind of frustrating. I had a lot of long games and they ended in a draw. This one was, uh, you know, uh, I think it's just a really good game, a lot of interesting ideas and uh, I hope to explain to the audience the best way I can so they can understand some of the moves and uh, I believe I played really precisely. I checked afterwards with the computer just to make sure and it really liked a lot of my moves actually. So. That's right, so you're going to show us your game from today. Yeah, um, from round uh, se uh, seven. Right, from, and yeah. this was against Shardal Gagari Shardal from Gagari, India. Grandmaster from India. Yeah, his uh, rating is not very high, but it's actually a very strong player. And, uh, Do you he think he's one of the underrated Oh, yeah, de de definitely, definitely. Because pretty you know, common, huh? Yes, yes. He beat uh, Grandmaster Vitigo with black, <laughs> and they beat uh, Eduard Romain with black, and uh, a very, very good performance and uh, only lost to Aronian yesterday. So he, he's still like gaining a lot of rating points. And when I was preparing for him, I look at a lot of his games and he had a lot of wins with block against very strong grandmasters. So I can see that he's a very talented player. But I found uh, that, you know, his opening repertoire is a little bit narrow and and he kind of went into the line that he plays and I had some pretty good preparation. So That's actually quite an interesting insight into how top grandmasters prepare. So you see uh, you you see the openings that your opponent is playing and try and catch their weaknesses. Absolutely. I mean, I, I look at it. I look at the statistics. See which lines he do he does well. And in this line, he had a couple of losses. He had a loss against Sashi Kiram in 2015. He had lost to Nigel Short recently in this line. He did have some wins as well, but I just look at mainly how does he do against top grandmasters when he plays. And I realize that maybe he's not as comfortable in this line. And uh, I look at the recent theory and check a couple of lines with the computer and just went for it. Is this the first time that you played against him? Yes, the first time I played him, but I played some of the, the very young and talented uh, Indian players. So they, they've been giving me a lot of hard time in this tournament so far. <laughs> They're very so, tricky. <laughs> yeah, so I've been losing a lot of rating points. Uh, but uh, now finally I had a good game. All right, let's so go. So let's start, yeah. So I played D4 and um, I always play D4, so there's no surprise. and. My opponent almost always plays the names of Indian recently. Uh, he also played Queen's Gambit Accepted a couple of years ago, but his recent games are all names of Indian. So I could play Knight F3 here, but then I have to worry about several moves here as block, Bishop B4, check, D5. So that's why I uh, decided to just go for the Knight C3 line. At least now I know that we can have the Nimzo Indian defense. Because he only plays the Nimzo. Yeah, he plays the Nimzo. And in fact, when you're preparing, oftentimes you can see me. I play both Knight C3 and Knight F3, but sometimes I don't play Knight F3 if I see my opponents play so many different lines against it. Uh, the early B6, Bishop B4, D5. So there could be so many different transpositions. With Knight C3, at least more or less, you know it's going to be a Nimzo Indian defense. So he played bishop before and queen c2, and this is a line uh, I was mentioning that, you know, he plays c5, which is not the main line here. The main lines are, you know, you can castle here, um, or you can play, uh, for example, d5. 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 These are the two, the main lines. But I noticed, the first thing I noticed when I was preparing, that he plays c5 exclusively. And that opened up a little window for me to, you know, try to see if I can get something so that was like a signal for you yes. that this could yeah. be a hole in yeah. his yeah. repertoire. Yeah, exactly. Then I realized that, you know, I should just look at this line and just not to worry about so many different th things. I just prepared this and if he plays this, I'll play my preparation. If he avoids it, then he's playing com something completely different. So, as expected, I took and now he castled. So either way, uh, it's, it's good for you because if he plays something different, you know it's a new position for him and he yes. doesn't have that experience. And Absolutely. if he plays this, you prepared for it. Absolutely, but one thing is also is very important to notice when you when I'm playing uh, with white, I also look at my opponents to see what he plays as white, because sometimes yeah uh, you know he is a d4 player himself, so that's why he would know a lot of the d4 positions because he plays it himself. So it makes a difference when opponent is an e4 player because you know he wouldn't be very familiar with the d4 structures. Setups. So yeah, uh, so I think a lot of the top players when they prepare they look at this. 
if they're playing some some opponents that they're not familiar with. So look at the other color. Other as color, well. yeah. Because I wanted to know like what he plays actually against Nimzo. That will give and you a little what, bit. What did he you played knight f3 against Nimzo. Okay. So I just tried to play something that he wouldn't be very familiar with. Um, and a3, and in this position, he has to take back with the bishop on c5 because the bishop c3 lines, they no longer work here because he is just not going to be able to pick up the pawn back here. You just go b4? I will just play b4 and protect my pawn. So that's why he had to play the move bishop c5 and knight. And here the first surprise of the game because he played the move b6. In the previous five games I saw, he, he always played the move bishop e7 here including his recent game against uh, Nigel Short. So bishop e7 was the move. It's a rare move. He's trying to get a headshot set up with d6, knight bd7, and b6, bishop b7. But this move allows e4 and uh, white is better here. And this is what you had in yeah, mind? Yeah, this is what I had in mind and uh, I was probably gonna uh, play something like bishop f4. So, but he played the move b6, which is a uh, theory. And, um, so it just goes into a Maroxi setup? And he's trying to, but with the b6 move, it's very hard now to get. Now he's trying to get the Maroxi bind. Like, let's say, if I play something like e3, for example, he will just play bishop e7, bishop e2, and actually black goes back bishop e7, high castle, d6, let's say you play b4, knight bd7. In this position, it looks good for white. Uh, but uh, in fact, black is very solid here. So rook f d d one, queen c seven, and rook comes to c eight. Yeah, queen rook comes to, to c eight. Exactly, queen a eight, and it's very difficult to do anything here. So that's uh, it, it. Looks good for white, but you can't really prove that you have an advantage here. So that's why you have to play bishop f four here in this position because this way I'm preventing him from getting that setup here. And you will see uh, just in a second, bishop b seven, and now another very important move, rook d one. So not the usual e3. No, not yet. To develop your because bishop. if you play e3, he might still be able to get that setup. Bishop e7 and d6. And d6. The difference now uh, is when I start with the move rook d1. If you try to get the setup with bishop e7, actually you don't have time. I play e4, d6, it rounds into e5 very strong, and queen is pinned on d8. Right. So that, that was my idea behi be behind this moves because it's a bit unusual. I mean, I'm leaving the bishop here, rook here, and not pushing the pawn, but rook on d1 is causing a lot of problems here. And you can never play the move queen e7, by the way, because after b4, the bishop is dropped. Yes. So, and he, and I, he wasn't very comfortable because he was so rook spending is quite line. precise, huh? Yeah, it's still theory, this, but uh, it's, a good, it's a good line for white. White is better here. So he was spending a lot of time, like 10, 15 minutes each move, which you know, uh, made me think that he wasn't expecting this. Probably expecting so the queens uh, with yeah, knight f3. Knight f3, yeah. So I played e3 here, and now he just cannot get uh, uh, the setup. So he went for this idea, h6, bishop e2. White is very comfortable. I'm hoping to castle, play the move rook uh, d2, rook f d1, and with a nice pressure on d7. So that's why he decided to play very concrete here while I'm uh, not castled yet. He played the move knight h5, trying to get rid of my strong bishop on f4. Now, I think the next few moves are forced. Bishop d6, I have to play. I mean, if I go bishop g3, black is just equalizing easily here because he will have the pair of the bishops. But why do you think he went for this uh, slightly forcing uh, way of playing with knight h5? Because there's actually no comfortable way for black to develop anymore. Yes, I mean, he's, he's worse, and I think he's a very tactical player. A lot of the, his wins against yeah. strong players, he comes up with some really great tactics. And you will see in this game, he was trying to do a lot of tactics and a lot of uh, 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 tricks he had, I had to watch out for. So he's a, he's a very good tactical player. So. This move, I believe he played, he spent some time and it was based on the fact that he wanted to try to uh, get some tactical ideas. You will see. Takes, takes, it's concrete, queen e7. Now, if I move the rook back, I don't have much advantage actually because he will go back knight f6, castle, and he will get that same d6, rook f d8. Yeah, it looks like you have a little bit of pressure, but not much. Right. Even if you try knight b5, he can even just go knight e8, and, and, and a6 then a6, next. rook a c8, knight f6, and black is okay here, still. So, this is a very important moment here. I really have to play the next move if I want to go for a uh, 
serious advantage. So that's queen d2. How much time did you take at this uh, <laughs> critical moment? To be honest with you, I would have just prob probably played this even quicker if it was a blitz game, but I just wanted to just double check the lines. And uh, I was just trying to understand where is he going because positionally it looks really bad for him. I mean, I have this strong rook on d6. I'm ready to castle, play rook fd1, and he's not going to be able to get rid of my rook here. So I was just trying to understand where is he going, where is his ideas here. So black really needs d6 in this position. He, he does. He absolutely has to get d6 in or do something else. But then I realized knight f6, castle, and here he played the only move that would, uh, you know, keep him in the game. Knight a5, very strong move. And here where tricks, tricks begin here because... Now, this move is threatening very strong knight b3. And if, let's say, I play the move, I had few options here. I have knight e5, very interesting, rook fd1 and b4. So I had to choose between these three moves here. So if I play knight e5, I didn't like the move knight b3, attacking my queen. And now if I go to d3, he can even play knight c5. So if I go queen d1 now, my rook cannot move, and now my rook on f1 is stuck as well here. So I didn't really like this. He can even go here, and then rook ac8. I don't like the way my pieces are placed here. So I rejected this line. I was considering the move knight e5, because the idea now I would like to just take, just threatening knight d7. But now he plays this move, knight b3, attacking my queen. And uh, again... I don't want to put the queen on d1 because that will block my rook from coming in. And if I go queen d3, knight c5, very strong. So I realize that I have to play the move b4. So you want this d1 square for the rook. Exactly, yeah. So you don't want to put your queen on d1. And I want to put the queen on d3 and the rook on d1. Right, I that's I the ideal setup, setup. you're Yes, for. but I got to cover the c5 square so this knight is not going to be able to harass me with knight c5 ideas. Right. And, and um, mm -hmm. Mara, I have to ask you that in this position after sure. knight a5, is black also threatening a move like knight d5 or that's not a threat? Uh, knight d5, it's not a threat immediately because I have... Uh, For example, if you just played something like h3 just to let's see what's say happening. h3, knight d5. Um, in fact, in this particular position, can I, I probably have d5? to play this. Yeah, you cannot take on fd6 because of knight f6 that's discovery right. check winning the queen. So I have to take back this. Yeah, that's, and I, I can probably get this position, which white will have a good compensation, but maybe not, 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 not much more. Special. Not much more. Yes, that's another threat. Absolutely. So, so before, before you have to play this move. Of course, my main idea was bishop f3. This is where I spent a lot of my time calculating the bishop f3 and all the consequences after this move, because after he takes, I cannot take back with the bishop because that loses to knight c4 attacking the queen and the rook. So I have to play g takes f3. Now the knight is under attack. So if he goes knight c6, then I can even just play f4. My rook is still very strong on d6. So I was considering this move knight b7 to try to remove my rook, but then the knight is really misplaced on b7. I go rook d4. And now even if he plays the move d6, I will play f4, following it out with bishop f3 putting a lot of pressure. The knight is very poorly placed on b7, doesn't have any squares to go to. And ideas like e5, I can always capture once. And if nothing else, I always have this idea. And white will always be better here. Again, due to the fact the knight is really badly placed on b7. So against he, the yeah, knight. against the knight. So he probably didn't like this idea. Probably, objectively, this is probably the best line for him. Uh, and I mean, it's hard to give up this bishop on b7 because you always feel it's, yeah. it's very strong. It, uh, could we just have a look at this line again? Because I think this is very, this is a very sure. important moment. So you okay. have to take with the pawn. I have to take with the pawn, yes. I have to return knight, uh, with my knight to b7. Yeah, if you go knight to 6 again, I just, I just play, uh, I can play, for example, even f4. And uh, rook yeah, fd1, bishop f3. A lot of pressure against d7 pawn. Right. So... And knight b7, you just... I just go rook d4. And your idea is to go f4, sure. bishop f3 next. f4, bishop, yeah, you can try to play a little bit more active with That's a5, I but I would just you. play, it's, it's, it's tricky because now you really weaken the b6 pawn <coughs> as well. So I go rook b1, you take, there's not much you're going to be able to do on an a file. And my plan is, again, the same idea, f4, bishop f3, and uh, 
playing against a poorly placed knight here. So I think slightly better, not, not a big advantage, but I think slightly better for sure for yeah. white here. That's actually, um, I mean, that's very strong positional um, concept and positional understanding because you're playing against this piece. It does, you're not obviously, I mean, it's not like you have a material advantage no, or anything, no, no. But, but the position is actually quite difficult for black here. Absolutely. It's, 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 nowadays, it's very hard to get anything more, you know, in opening. Everybody knows theory, so it's something like this. It's, you know, pretty much the maximum we can hope for to get. Uh, just a comfortable uh, s small advantage here but his move is actually quite tricky uh, he played uh, he played the move uh, knight b3 so he he didn't let's see here we can get back I mean, knight b3 looks really scary uh, how I know is that I know going back? I know I know but it's it's very tricky move so he played this after some consideration here and f okay I have two options here Queen d3 and queen uh, d1. So, again, I, it's just the concept is you never want to put the queen on d1 in this, in this position. And here, it's very concrete idea. If you go here, he, he had a very nice trick here. Can, uh, Anyone in can the anybody audience? see the move that he had in mind? Mm -hmm. I didn't see it at first. And then I start calculating. I say, he must have some trick here. And yeah, then because no one's going to blunder <laughs> the knight. Well, well, I'm not really threatening to take, to take it. it. But if you move the rook, next move. Yeah. But then I realized it's just a really nice idea he has. Uh, anybody? Knight C1. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> Knight C1. Nice. Well done. <laughs> See, you usually don't expect this yeah. move. It's just such a you know a rare idea. But the Knight C1 is a beautiful move because it's like a deflection. I can't take it because I drop my rook, and then he takes my light square bishop and. I don't have anything. I might. That's beautiful, no? Yeah, very, very nice trick. Yeah. So, and then I, I had to play this move, but I knew that he has something because again, if I put this here and the next move play rook f d one, this knight is trapped. Yes. So now he had another trick prepared. E five, very strong move, mm -hmm. and now block has two threats here. So the first threat it's obvious he's threatening to play e four, but what is the second threat? Do you see the second threat he has? Knight? D4? Exactly. The next move is knight d4, blockading the d file, and uh, I will have to sacrifice in exchange. So now it's very concrete here. It seems like maybe he's taking over the initiative here. So he's got, he's got two threats. Yeah. yeah. e4, just forking, and knight d4, interference, and picking up my exchange. I mean, I can probably. At first, I thought this was really strong, to be honest, because. If he plays e4, it doesn't work. I have this strong knight takes e4. If bishop takes e4, I take queen b3, and I'm up a pawn, and close to be winning. And if he takes back with the knight, I was quite happy because I have rook d7, picking up d7. Yeah. At first, I thought maybe I'm just winning. But then I realized, let's, let me double check. And then you and, found... And then I see this knight d4 move. Beautiful idea again. And now I'm forced to... Uh, to give up an exchange? Oh, another idea. If I take, hoping that if he takes back, he has this move. I mean, I, I'm doing great take here. On D3 and Rook D3 and then I D7 also take on D7. Hanging. But the problem here, I think he has this move. In between move. E4 oh attacking wow. my queen and next one he will pick up my rook. It's unbelievable. So many tricks. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Just... Well, I've got to sure. go back because there's so much going on in this position and so many pieces hanging. Yes, yes. And so many threats. So at this moment, knight d5 is not working. A at this moment, knight d5 is not just working. Just take cd5, cd5, sorry. There are a few, few things here I can do. Let's see here. I think um, I, think I was just going to do this. Take. You cannot take again. Because knight, knight f6, f6, so I want take, to take on d5. Take, and at the end, the knight, is, knight just is just trapped. Yeah, right, the knight is just trapped. Right, this is the simplest. Yeah, that's the simplest way. I could so this win. was your repetition for yes, this line? Yes, for that line, yeah. So he went e5. Yeah, and it was very difficult. I, I had to, I mean, I had to find this idea and calculate really deep here because I could be worse here. I mean, it's, it's so many tricks he has. So what do you think white should play here? I mean, one big point is that this knight on b3 is trapped. Yes, exactly. And you have to use that, but, but he has his own threats and sort of my rook is trapped here. 
I mean, as a bailout method, I had this, but I mean, this is not something that, okay, I can play this and claim I have some compensation because I have good pieces and a pawn for exchange. This is about equal. But then um, I started to calculate and um, e even before going into this, I knew that you know this line is possibly gonna work. So I had to just work out the rest of the line. So the move is rook takes f6. So I get rid of my rook that was hanging on d6 and now I'm just gonna play and try to trap this b3 knight. Right. So, and we have a suggestion of knight e4 here, but that, like you said, does not work because... Knight e4, just rook d7. Yes, you've got yeah. this rook d7. Yeah. So... But now, when I took now, he played e4. Another in-between move. In fact, it's, it's the same thing. If he plays um, queen f6, that actually will allow additional move rook b1. I might even play this move. Or I can just play queen c2, which, was, which is going to be a transposition into the game. You will see. E4, knight E1 is the game. Right. So and this knight on B3 has nowhere yes. to go. So he played E4, I go queen C2, and I think he underestimated this position, knight E1. I go to a very ugly square, but that's the only square I have available for the knight. I cannot go to D2, I cannot go to D4, H4, so I have to go to this very ugly square, and but the knight is trapped. And if he goes knight A1, <laughs> queen B2, <laughs> A5, and important to keep it closed. You can't take B5. only one because of no, AB4. Yes, and just keep it closed and collect the knight, and then knight c2, knight d4 is winning. So um, here he started to think, and I realized he probably overlooked uh, something or maybe underestimated this position that he thought maybe he'll have some contraplay. And it seems like nothing really works here. And he went for knight d4 idea to you know, sacrifice the knight, but at least he will gain a pawn. Yes. So he played the move knight d4. I think it's his best option. At least he will get a pawn here. Uh, if d5, yeah, that's just an another move I have to take. d takes c4. I was thinking about this because this opens up the positions and it's good for the player who has two rooks. But here I think it's very important move knight e2. The threat is queen c6 now and c3 is hanging. So. Knight e2 is very strong now to but put the knight queen on d4. Where is the bishop going? Let's see. Ah, maybe queen c6. Uh, okay, so let me. Maybe knight to b5 instead? Yes, With the yes, same yes, idea? yes. Knight b5. Just keep this. I just basically need to put a bishop on e2, knight on d4, and then knight c2, the knight will come out. Okay, so, so yeah. the setup you're aiming yeah. for is bishop on e2, knight d4. Yeah, like the something like this. I just. Go ahead. No, first you go bishop, bishop e2, e2. Bishop e2, and I'm also still threatening knight a7 yeah. too. So, but let's say he plays a6. I just need to consolidate the position. I may as well actually just go bishop d5 here. Trade pieces. Eventually the knight will come out, either through c2 or g3, knight g2. Eventually my pieces will come out, and I think, you know, the two pieces versus rook is going to prevail. So, but I had to make sure... Uh, Something like this I was worried about a little bit because position gets open and the rooks can become rooks strong. become strong and my pieces are discoordinated, but I think I'm just uh, I'm just in time. So he played knight d4, took I mean this is still not so easy because I still he, he has a rook and a pawn for two pieces. I still I have to play very, very precisely here. And uh, it's uh, so I spent some time here. I was uh, considering giving knight b5, but I realized what I need to do is I need to put a knight on c2 here. Knight is very strong on c2 here. I can get my rook into the game, and then eventually the knight is going to come to e3. That is a very strong outpost for the knight. So the square that you're aiming for for the e1 knight is e3. I was actually reading this um, um, this book by Gelfin where he, he talks about finding the right squares for the pieces. Yes. And that sort of helps you to understand what moves to play next. So exactly, here if you yeah. get that, your knight on e1 needs to be the next piece that needs to come out. Exactly. In general, when opponent has a central pawn that is advanced like this, in general, just you want to block it with a knight. That would be a good, good, good way to do it. So I played the move queen b3. Now I would like to play the move knight c2. And if he plays the move e3, I was going to play knight c2. Takes rook f2. Knights are car guarding every square. And in fact, if you play the move queen d2, I have just bishop f3, attacking the queen and b7. And queen c1, you've queen got rook c1, f1. Just rook f1, and now 
uh, winning. Again, Knight is very strong on C2, is covering very important E3 square. So in this line, <coughs> so he probably has to put the queen somewhere here. And again, we see how strong the knight is on C2. I, I have to exchange the light square bishop. Again, knight is doing a great job now covering E1 and E3 So you want squares. to exchange the light square bishop yes. because? Because now I will have an outpost for my knight on d5, and I will be able to put one knight on d5, another knight on e3, and, to, and just basically try to attack him. Yeah. But once, once the knight lands on d5, it's going to be very strong. So he doesn't really have any threats. Like I was looking at lines like knight d5. See, again, he doesn't even have a check. All the scores the knight covers. So like he can play here. I can just go knight e3. Check, I have rook f1, right. and queen will come to c3, h3, king h2. This is a very safe position for white. Should be just technically winning here. So this queen b3 was very important, but now he played the move f5. I think he has to try something. So he's got a pawn advantage there, so he's advancing his pawn. So knight c2, and he played queen f6. In fact, both, if he played the move queen e5, my idea is going to be the same. And this is very important. When opponent is about to advance his pawns, and the, when pawn gets on f4, it's going to be very annoying. You always have to watch out for f3, in some positions even e3, so you want to try to stop that. And the way to do it here is f4. Again, now I would like to put the knight on e3, and uh, blockade everything, and if he takes en passant, then bishop takes f3, we get a uh, similar position with the knight landing on d5, and king is actually a little bit exposed now with the f5 pawn move, so probably this was his best line to play, but this is, I think, still should be technically because winning. he's aiming to open up files for his rooks. Yes, with so I think, yeah, he, he should have probably done something like this. I think it's still winning, but maybe a little bit more chances for him. Maybe I just go h3 here. Rook e3, I can trade piece. The knights are very strong here. Right. And eventually, I think white will just win. But he didn't, he didn't like this, so he went back. He played king h8, and now I'm very happy with the knight on e3. Now, basically, after this move, the, the, the white is just winning here because there is no counter play. The next move is going to be rook d1, and some knight b5, knight d6 ideas coming. This is, I already felt very comfortable here. And he went for this queen d4 move. I think he probably overlooked my next move here, or, or the idea. So queen d4 he played. He was also low on time. Knight b5, and perhaps he was counting on the fact he can play queen d2, attacking the bishop. But here I have a very nice move here. Bishop page 5. That's good too. I was thinking to play king f2 actually, with idea rook d1, just, just trap trapping the queen. The queen yeah. <laughs> bishop, same, same idea. But probably bishop h5, he can go queen d3. Yes. Uh -huh. It's still winning, but yeah, I think I really like king f2 because. It just controls everything, and now you just play the move rook d1, and the queen is trapped. I even looked at this line, a5, rook d1. a4? Yeah, and just queen b1. And nowhere to go. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, after king f2, he probably can't even defend against yeah. this idea. So, yeah, he, he, of course, yeah, that means he lost, like, uh, two temples now. He had to go back, rook d1. But I think after the knight on e3, it's just lost. I just had to be a little bit careful here, because he, he will do another aggressive move, g5. And this is the right way to play. When you're losing, you should try to go for the most aggressive idea, perhaps confuse your opponent. Yeah, he could have played like some defensive move, but then he's just losing after b5. The bishop is getting trapped. So at least he's trying to complicate the matters with g5. And, you know, I just had to be precise here. So there's so many ideas here and tempting options I had. Like, for example, I was very uh, yeah, happy to see this, but then it seems like I'm just winning after rook d6, right? But then suddenly this check is very annoying. So, so I didn't want to allow this. Um, I, I didn't want to allow much counterplay. So and it's actually quite easy to miss these yes. things. Yes, I mean, know? yeah, you have to be careful. See, if you just play g3, then suddenly he takes, takes and some checks, some, some counterplay. So I had to be precise. And luckily I had enough time here. So I took a couple of minutes here and calculated the most precise uh, idea. Maybe this is winning as well. To be honest, something like this, queen h3, with a lot of threats. But I just wanted something clean with no counterplay. And then I was happy to 
uh, see this idea. I just took. Now, if he takes back with the pawn, I just take knight f5, so he has to take with the queen. And now, very important move, queen c3 check, bringing the queen into the game. And now the black king is exposed here. He has two options, king g8 or king h7. He played king h7, but king g8 is also not very good. At some point, I'll have c5 and bishop c4 check come in. So he played here. It, it's lost anyway here. And now, b5, dropping the bishop. The idea behind this move is now, if he plays f4, which is his only idea, I capture the bishop, he takes only e3, and now knight takes e4, attacking the queen, and now the killer rook d7 is coming in. So that's why I gave a check to force the king to come to h7, so I can have this e7 idea. Check in yeah. the end. This line is very strong, even with the king on g8. So, but this way it's just even stronger. So I think he realized that, so he didn't play this, so he just played rook a d8. And now again, if you can take material, just calculate and take. Don't go for anything more fancy. And I'm ahead, a lot of material here, but I just decided to give up one piece back just to simplify. So it takes, he took, bishop takes. And now again, the final move of the game, queen e3 blockading with bishop idea bishop c2. c2 so he resigned here and just completely winning so so yeah happy to play a good game after i had a really long three days in a row i played 105 moves in round four and then i had another six and a half hour two games so um so i was happy to have a little short game but var i have to say i mean it, it might have been a short game but there was a lot, lot of calculation, of calculation yeah. Yeah. involved yeah. Yes, I mean, it's, uh, and, and the most important thing is the, what makes me happy when you go back and start check to see the lines you calculate are good. Yes, are and they actually that, work. That shows that, you know, your, your brain was working, you know, you're, you know, doing a good job because you can calculate a lot of tough stuff, but it's, if it's not correct, a lot of these lines are very precise, even after checking with the computer. You know, you were saying this idea with knight a5 and knight b3 is very interesting, and it was interesting, but it just seemed to end up in a position that was worse for black. Yes. Where do you think he, what was the point I where think, he actually went wrong then? I think, uh, he, I think he chose uh, the line. Okay, the first to start with the c5, it's not a move that equalizes because then everybody would be playing this. So this, this is, I think this line is slightly inferior to start yeah. with. And then he didn't play, um, he, he didn't play the, 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 the very main, main lines, you know? So I think like, like for example, there are there are some other lines in this position, like he, like his bishop e7 move was a possibility. He could have maybe played that. That's a little bit more solid. So it seems like this b6 line it's uh, slightly better uh, for white. One thing I can pinpoint, I think this move is interesting. There's a knight h5 move here right. that you can try to play with ideas f5, a little bit more aggressive. But still, I think white is uh, doing well here. Had you well seen here. this b6 move? Yes, in your yes, okay, yes. You had yes. I, I, I looked at this move. Not very deeply, but I looked at it. Yeah, it was just to get, to get some ideas. So, and I think he really based on um, his calculation on this move knight a5. I think he, uh, let's see here if we can get that position. So he was counting on the fact that this knight a5 is going to work. I mean, it was a very long line. Yeah. And it perhaps he just overlooked the very strange looking knight one move at the end of that line. It's uh, he's a very good tactical player, but it's possible to miscalculate. And just knight one is a hard move to see. Maybe in a long line he missed that I do have this knight one square for my knight to go to. But yeah, it looks like it's just it's just not going to work this concept. And uh, probably the best option was just to take on b3, and uh, we discussed this line. So bishop f3 and play this, g takes it. No, this doesn't work, so I have to play. And to just go back with the knight? Yeah, go back and just, I think it's slightly worse, not, not. I mean, just the knight is misplaced, but it's just very slightly worse. The problem with moves like knight b3 is that if you if miss it doesn't that, work, yes. Yeah. you're probably yeah. just losing. Yes, and, and yeah, it didn't quite work out, but again, there were so many nice tricks, and he was probably interested in you know seeing some queen d1, knight c1 idea. It was that was very, ve ve very tempting, you know. But uh, yeah, I uh, calculated that you know I have queen d3, and uh, looks like yeah, I, uh, there is nothing really black can do. Rook f6. Yeah, I mean yeah, this move is hard because you just 
you just give up the rook for a knight and then you just calculate uh, that the knight is trapped, yeah. I mean, yeah, perhaps this knight one move. And taking on, e on f3 first does not work because you just take bishop f3? No, uh, actually, if you do that, if you take, just go rook takes f3, it's even better. Bishop takes f3, bishop f3, the rook is hanging and the knight is trapped. This is just completely winning. Right. Yeah. So the rook made some nice tour, rook d6, rook f6, rook f3. <laughs> yeah, so, and uh, he couldn't also play gf because then his king is first of all uh, completely exposed and now I think I will just do the same idea. Queen c2, it's important to move the queen away from this e4 threat. So g takes f was still keeping the threat of e4, so that's why I go queen c2. Now the knight is trapped. And if you play this move, and now I don't have to go back to only one, I actually have a you better have square. H4. H4, and then eventually knight will come to f5. So, and the knight is still trapped yeah, here. Yeah, even if he goes something like queen e5, you can always, after taking yeah, the knight on b3, go g3. Exactly, and then g2. yeah. The knight is very safe here. And so, I, I, I calculated this too, just in case. So, yeah, this. this also, game. I think what's amazing is that this uh, this game actually illustrates the problems that black can face if if they're not able to play moves like d6 and d5 in such situations. Once you get this bind in with rook on d6. Exactly. Very hard. Yeah. I mean, very hard to do anything. I mean, if I'm just basically one more move. I, let's say you. Let's say he would play this move. Then I play this, and next move is b4 coming, and you really cannot do anything to remove this. You cannot even play bishop c8 with idea knight e8 because that runs into rook c6. Yes. So you <laughs> really don't really have a way to remove this bind. Bishop c8 you know. defending the d7 yeah. pawn does not but drops, help. Yeah, drops that. So, okay, maybe uh, he can... Rook, rook a8 and knight b8. Okay. Yes, uh, but yeah, but then knight b8. Yeah, maybe something like this. Just to get knight e8 in. But... Uh, I did, I just have... No, 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 first rook f8 and then there. Uh-huh. So rook d8. Rook d8. Yeah, here I might uh, just play just a useful move, h3. Right, d8 and... If rook d3, then this is hanging, so... And rook d4, knight c6. But you, even oh, this... Knight c6, no, d7. Ah, uh, d7, so you it cannot play... D6, then. Ah, d6. I play d6 first. And do I have time now for this, knight b5? So we have to calculate. Bishop f3 almost always will be better for white, yeah? I mean, something like this. Why Lots of pressure. But you can perhaps just play knight c6 in that it position. It works, knight c6. Instead of bishop f3? <laughs> no, uh, knight d6, knight, knight d4, knight d4, and it looks like you're first, yeah? Knight e2. Knight e2 or, or knight, knight f3, yes. yeah. So. Yeah, but but yeah, I mean, this takes lots of efforts, you know, to put yes. all the knights back. I'm sure we can all play. Pieces on the first I, track. I, I'm pretty sure we can play better for white, you know. Maybe we just need to play e4 or something. <laughs> I'm sure we can play better for white too. Yeah to have a, a decent advantage here. Perhaps just e4, knight c6, rook goes back to d3. Yeah, because that knight on e8 is also not coming back. Yeah, yeah, and at some point you have to watch out for some e5 ideas. Knight e5? Knight e5, you don't have enough defense on takes, d8. Takes, and d8 hangs. Because of the huh? problems with this line with bishop f4 and rook d1. Yes. Uh, castles is a bit of a, a waste in tempo. What about d c5 and queen c7? Uh, a way to try and arrange the same, uh, the same uh, without. Instead of castle? Instead of castle, so immediately queen c7, what do you think of this line, theoretically? So we have a suggestion, instead of uh, black going castle on move 5? Yeah, ah, queen c7 here, okay. Yes, 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 you can play this. You can also play bishop c5 here immediately. This is another rare line. This was played by Akopian. The point of this move is that you, actually, you can actually get a head chuck here. I actually played a couple of times as black. The point here is that you very quickly go queen b6. So you're not allowing <laughs> the bishop to come out. So you force the move e3 and then you drop back on e7. I mean, you lose a lot of tempos, but you play a6, queen c7, d6, eventually you can get a head chuck. And then white wants to develop this bishop on b2. 
yes, but in this line, uh, white can be sometimes aggressive, like b3, bishop b2, and this is g4, g5 idea could be played. So because black loses a lot of tempos, so sometimes white can play something uh, like this. Even Carlson had a game long time ago, like he won with this g4, g5, because you have lots of uh, extra tempos here. So. It's a possibility, but I think objectively the line, it's, it's white is still better, doing really well on this line, uh, even with queen c7. But yeah, in this particular game, it just came down to that one tempo. Yeah. If he had the extra tempo, he could try to remove the rook, but uh, he just didn't have that extra tempo. Um, so going back to the game. So again, it's a very important move, rook d1 here, because yes. it's not the most obvious move here. It looks like you should just play e3, bishop e2, but then you come up with the rook uh, d1 first. Again, the point here is that if the bishop drops back, I don't want to play bishop d6. I would like to play the move e4 here, which is very strong. Not allowing d6. Not allowing d6. d6 is probably loses to e5 here, and we take on d6. And so many times it happens when we are playing, uh, especially at the beginning of the game, we make these what we call hand moves, you know, moves like e3, just taking yes, out our bishop, yes. but we are missing out on critical moments like this then. It happens all the time. Like if I didn't know the idea or it was a blitz game, maybe I would have just played e3, very natural move. But this, I just knew about this idea because there are some lines here that knight h5, white even goes back like bishop g5, f6, you actually go back on c1. <sighs> After creating yeah. weakness creating and some weaknesses, and now you're basically threatening g4. Just trapping the knight. Yeah, trapping. If you go bishop h4, then the knight, is, knight has f4 score, so he has to play f5. So this is, this is this theory. Perhaps this is the direction now uh, the black should go for. But it, it, looks, it looks better for white, but this, this could be, I think, maybe g3, bishop g2. It's a possibility here as well. That's uh, actually very interesting, and I think what, uh, at least what's fascinating for me in this game is that there's this very strong positional concept in it of binding black's pieces, not allowing yes. d65, but at the same time, there are so many tactical tricks that you you have to be aware of. So it's sort of combining positional and tactical aspects of Absolutely, game. Absolutely, yeah. I had, to, I had to watch out. Like, like, this is the critical position right here, where he has two threats, I mean the most obvious is e4 and the other one, which is harder to see is, uh, so it's possible, you can just play, think of there's a great move, rook fd1 you play, thinking okay I stop this uh, move, e4, next move I just play queen c2 and I'm just winning the game, the knight is just gonna be trapped and then suddenly out Thank of you. nowhere, knight d4 comes in and now this is uh, gonna be a, a new game. Okay, white is it's just about equal here. So, okay, I have uh, one study position, so we need to right. load. And so, do uh, we, just before we move oh, on, do we have any more questions? Uh, questions or? about the game, if you have, or... Alright, so we're ready to solve the study that okay, you have Okay, yeah, let's us. take a look at the study here. Let's see, where is it? Analysis, which is oh. oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I see it. Now. see it. Yeah, just the second one. Yes. Okay. I've. Um, I'm a big fan of studies, and uh, I've. I've lots of them. I've done many of them in my. This is like a, uh, when we were training, we would do a lot of these studies when I was growing up here in Armenia, and uh, this is one of the studies I really like. And you might be familiar with it. Some of you, it's a famous one, I guess. But uh, it, it's white to play here, and. Uh, and you need to try to make a draw. And here, the problem here, black is just going to queen, and you're not in a square to stop his pass bomb, but he is in a square to be able to stop your breakthroughs here. So that, that's what makes it difficult here. So let's see if you can find this uh, idea here. We're perhaps going to give a couple of minutes. Yeah, to let's give a couple of minutes to, you know, to so the audience and see if they can solve it. Absolutely. Now, Barb, while they're thinking and coming up with a solution, were you, when you were growing up, were you solving a lot of studies yes, as well? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. When I was growing up, this was a big part of my homework, and uh, my coach uh, would give me a lot of homework. Very difficult. I mean, it was, this was very difficult for me when I was, you know, but I was just trying to solve lots of Petrosian and uh, Kasparian studies. You know, uh, he was very, you know, 
very yes. uh, composer. So we would saw a lot of Kasparian studies here. So this is from his book. And how do you how do you feel um, uh, the process of solving many studies? What is what aspect of the game does that help you? It, it, it helps uh, that uh, you become more creative. You look for ideas, creativity. It improves your calculation, and you just start looking at unexpected moves, unorthodox ideas, unusual moves. So, and then you just become more creative. It helps your calculation and also your end game. Right, so you know, imagination like, yeah. and your ability. Yeah, because it studies are usually, it's like an end game. There are not so many pieces on the board. Um, Forced lines? Yeah, yeah. I, and I'm not a big fan of the very crazy ones where you have like everything is hanging and you just, you just have to figure out the neat move, you know. I'm more like this kind of studies where it's really the idea. You have to come up with the idea first. We do have one suggestion uh, from Nana Zagnitze from Georgia. She plays for sure, the top sure. board. So she suggests F4 here. Okay, F4. Nana, okay. have you calculated till the very end? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> She's F4. Ready for you. So, so first, what, what we need to do is we need to understand why black can't take, right? Mm -hmm. If he takes, he might even lose because of H4. And, no, and now black is no longer in the square. And uh, so basically... You, you're just not in time. So that's why this doesn't work. As well as if he tries to push his pawn, the king on b8 will be in check yes. at the very and end. And if you try to push the pawn after capture, in fact, white will win this. Yes. We're only trying to draw this, but now we're going to win because we're going to be able to queen with a check. So. so that's why now black will play the best move, king c7. And this way now he's getting closer to where the break is coming. F takes G5. <laughs> See, I uh, takes now. It looks like he's just gonna push, yeah. Yes. King G3, That's correct. Yes. That's amazing, huh? G3. <laughs> yeah. So it's a self a self stalemate. So you build your own stalemate. Yeah. Yeah. Self stalemate. Uh, Nana Zagnitze. Uh, very good. Very good. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I uh, I recommend also a lot of players. I mean, in uh, you know in uh, you know for Russian Soviet schools, you know they, it was kind of the coaches would do a lot of studies. I don't know if nowadays, but I think uh, even some top players they really enjoy doing a lot of these studies. It really helps uh, with the creativity and just to be able to see that. Like this idea, it's a self stalemate idea. There are a few other positions like this studies out there. And it's, this is not the only one. There are a few others that I know of. Yeah, you have to sort of visualize uh, how you can trap yourself. Yes, yeah. yes, because you just uh, everything else doesn't work. If you play h4, he will just take, and now the king is just so much closer. Yes. To any of the to any of the breaks, so king is just <gasps> they're gonna easily be able He's to to stop that. So uh, so that's why we have to start off with uh, move f4, and you, you take the material. And again, we're just, we're, we're just late with our break. First, he will just prevent our pawn, control it, and then he will push his. And you're just not in time with your game. Yeah. So that's, that's the The idea. other thing about studies is the precision that it requires. I calculation, mean, yeah. Calculation. Absolutely. And, yeah, and the fact that there's only one correct move order to the solution. Oh, yeah. You can't start with king g3 in this position. Exactly. The correct the, the studies, they just have to have one solution. If yes. there are multiple solutions, that means it's not very right. precise anymore. Now, I tell us that you, uh, you're from Armenia, you're Armenian born, but now you play for the U.S. Yeah, and long, uh, long time already. Long yeah. time, 17 yeah. years. I live in the U.S. 17 years already, yes. Right, now, but you, when you were growing up, you went to the Petrosian School of Chess. Yes. I tell us a bit about that experience. Yeah, so when, uh, when I was about seven years old, I went to the Tigran Petrosian World Champion number nine. Uh, school in Yerevan, Armenia, and uh, and I was enrolled in a group lessons with my first coach, and uh, that's where I learned how to play. And uh, but I was already I already knew a little bit how to play. Like my father taught me how to play. So, but uh, I took it more seriously. And then I grew up actually, you know, with uh, some very very top players like Levon Aronian. He's playing here, so he's one year older than me. So we played a lot against each other. We was like, he in the same school oh, as you? Not in the same school. He was coached privately, but we would compete against each other in a 
uh, Armenian Junior Championships and other. And there was another close friend, Gabriel Sargisian. Yeah, he's in the Armenian yeah, national he's, team. He's actually exactly the uh, same as, age as me, and we had the same coach, so we trained a lot together. Wow. So, so uh, three of us and then a few other guys. And then how did the move, why did the move to the U.S.? And happen? I moved to U.S. in uh, January 2001, and just, uh, yeah, things were, you know, very difficult in Armenia and uh, the work and economy, so, and just my family. I had a lot of family in Los Angeles already. My grandmother, my, uh, my relatives were already living there, like 15 years, so my family decided to take a chance and move to U.S. and, you know, and try to pursue the American dream. <laughs> <laughs> And how's it, how's it, how's that going? Yeah, it's going great. I mean, it couldn't be happier. I mean, it's uh, living, you know, living here for 17 years in U.S. And uh, everything is going great for me. I mean, I'm still playing, but I'm uh, doing a lot of coaching nowadays. And uh, I have many private students that I train. And uh, But I still enjoy the playing part. Yeah. It's still, when you play a good game, you analyze, you still enjoy that. But I would say that I uh, coach more than I play. But this year I'm hoping to play more. We'll see. Are you also training some, uh, because there are so many talented youngsters coming up from US as well. Yes, I've trained about three young grandmasters and, uh, you know, still working with them. Uh, can't reveal all the names, <laughs> but, you know, I work with some of the very top players in US. And, uh, and some of my other private students are about international master strength already. That I, right. I start training them from 1500 rating to an international master. So. And you enjoy, you're saying yeah. you actually enjoy training a yeah, lot? Yeah, I enjoy, uh, you know, teaching, you know, it's like a passion, you know, that I can explain my moves and uh, try to help them understand the game better. Yeah. And yeah, and so I've been doing this for a very long time. this game yeah. that you showed yeah. us and just yeah. your way of explaining. Yeah, this is, you know, I've been doing this for a very long time at the lectures and uh, uh, you probably know the St. Louis Chess Club and Scholastic Center. So yes. I've been working with them since 2012 going there as a lecturer, giving lectures, and, uh, you know, I like to show them my games because I think that's the best way I can explain. If yeah. I take somebody else's the great game, I won't know the ideas and the uh, subtleties, you know, but my games, I can explain exactly the way that I was thinking. Yeah, and that's very important. Yeah. Because not just showing the variations, but what was the really thinking, thinking process. How did you come to that move and how, what made you realize wh what should be played at that point? Absolutely, yeah. Well, we're open to questions from our online viewers. You can send them to us on uh, Twitch. Uh, anything from the audience? We're waiting. Uh, yes, yeah, go ahead. Yes, presumably um, it's Armenian from here. Yeah? Originally from Armenia, so, yes. So you kind of, as you're growing up, you were funded there. Was there any sort of opposition or hostility to you moving to the U.S. and, and playing for... No, no. When I moved to U.S., I was like a promising player, but I wasn't a grandmaster. I became a grandmaster in U.S., so I was a young international master. But I did win a couple of medals for the Armenian team already in the junior tournaments. The Olympiad champion, we were under 16, in a team with Levon Aronian, Gabriel Sargassian, <laughs> Tigran Petrosian. So we had, we had a, like, my generation was pretty strong, so it was strong competition. You know, uh, always, you know. No, there wasn't anything like that. They weren't happy, but, you know, you know. No, 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 no. It was, it was already like, uh, you know, it was 2001, so it wasn't anything like that. Yeah. It's interesting. We have a question from Twitch. We have a question from Twitch. Yes. Who do you think will be a challenger for the World Championship? So who do you think will be the challenger for the World Championship? Well, I'm going to go with my friend Levon, of course. <laughs> you know? I mean, I, I feel like he's due, you know. He's due and he's had some fantastic results last year. If you remember, he won several tournaments including the World Cup, the only way he could have qualified. Yes. Because he wasn't going to qualify by rating or Grand Prix. So I'm going for Levon and I think... Uh, he won Norway chess. Which he won did. Norway chess and he's just been doing really well. St. Louis, Rapid and Blitz. Right. And uh, so I think this is uh, his, I think, last tournament before the candidates. So I think uh, he won a good game today against Nigel. And uh, if he can finish strong, I think this will send some more positive uh, notes for him. And I think... Uh, I'm hoping that he can win because I feel like, you know, he's playing really good chess and he's due for something like that to at least play a match for the World Championship. And do you also believe that he's probably the one who can put up the best fight against uh, Magnus Carlsen? I think, I think at the moment it's just, it's my opinion, but also I think Magnus mentioned recently also in his interviews that, you know, Levon is the guy who can outplay him. Yes. And, you know, this happened many times and I think from the people, I mean, 
that are in the field, you know, maybe not a person that could be Kramnik, that it could be a difficult opponent for him, but it seems like against others he has a, he has an advantage. Yes. So somehow he will he will be a big favorite. But against Levon, I think he will be very close. Right. I have to ask you also now. Uh, you you're part of the U.S. Federation, but you also have really, like you said, great relationship with with Armenia, Armenian players. So when yes. you're at the Olympia, now Armenian chess team is also a one that's to look out for. They do really well. They've got this team spirit and, uh, you know, it's always fun to watch them and they've won medals as well, led by Levon. Yes, yes. Uh, and now there's the U.S. team, which won in Baku. Uh, who are you, who do you root for? Who, what is it that... Well, first of all, uh, Armenian team didn't play in Baku. No, they, they didn't. Couldn't I go. mean, they could have played, but I think they, technically uh, they could yeah, have, yeah, but they, they chose not to. Yeah, they could have probably gone, but they didn't go. So it was pretty clear I cheer for the U.S. team. Yes. At that time. And... Uh, uh, Armenian team won the Olympia a couple of times, uh, three years. But to be honest, nowadays it's uh, the other teams are just getting a lot stronger. In fact, the U.S. team is very strong, and uh, we'll see what will this Olympiad bring. But I think the competition is getting tougher. So I think definitely the the with the U.S. team at the moment. So I'm hoping to be part of the team. I'm very close yes. to qualify. So it will come down to the U.S. championship. That's the last tournament. And if I have a, it's right now a very close race between a few of us. So the first three places are locked for our top players because they're just so high ranked. So the U.S. champion will qualify automatically if any of the guys wins besides the top three. Or then there is a formula, rating formula. There is about four people now, you know, fighting for those two Olympiad spots. So in a very close race. So every game even played here is important. It counts. Yeah, going forward to my next tournament in March and then middle of April with the U.S. Championship. So that will be the most important event for me this year. Right, and uh, Var, there has been a lot of um, talk, so to say, uh, about all the players that are coming to the U.S. I mean, this time in Baku, for example, we saw this amazing team. Yes. Um, you know, they just, um, they were the favorites. They're such a strong team. But you've got a lot of competition when there are players coming from a lot of different countries now playing for the U.S. Federation. How do you, what do you, how do you feel about that? For me, it's, it's, it's normal. I think competition, you need competition to work on your game to get better. If there is no competition, you feel like I'm always going to qualify for the team. You know, for a few years, I didn't have to really work very hard. I was always on a team. But now, last Olympiad, I didn't, I didn't qualify. Yeah. So there were other people who were a little bit higher, they qualified and they went with a strong team and they won the gold medal. So now I want to be back. It's a healthy competition. <laughs> so I want to be back, try to, to prove I can be part of the team and hopefully win another medal. So the competition so, motivates you for Yeah, I think people are coming. You probably know we have a lot of uh, universities who offer scholarships and it's very attractive to the foreign uh, GMs, you know, who are thinking about professional career, but they know it's very tough. So they have an opportunity to come to U.S. St. Louis, Dallas, uh, a few other places to s get very good education and uh, for free actually, if you you know if you pass the tests and you get a full scholarship. So mm -hmm. it's it's a good competition. We have a lot of people also applying for a green card, and you know when you apply at some point you can maybe even switch your federation. So there's always this process. In fact, I sometimes help people with a letter of recommendation for their green card, which is fine. People help me when I move, so now it's my turn to help others. Chess is becoming really big, no, in the United States? Yes, uh, yeah, it's all thanks to the St. Louis, you know, because before that it was, yeah, we had some tournaments, some open tournaments, but now, uh, you know, since the chess club in St. Louis uh, opened in 2009, and every year, every year is getting bigger, a lot more tournaments, and this year there are going to be a lot of events happening there as well. So the calendar is full. Almost every month they have tournaments. Right, and we've got, uh, before we move on to... Uh, other stuff, we've got a question from one of the Chess.com members, uh, he, Swen, Swen P or Swen SP, I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, but he wants to know that which kind of endgame studies should I start with if I'm new to this form of training? So what sort of endgame studies do you look at? Uh, I, would, I would recommend a couple of names. I mean, you have to try a few of them, see how difficult they are. The studies are usually pretty difficult, so it's... I would, uh, I, would, I would recommend Kasparian. Kasparian, it's, you know, uh, Kubel. Uh, Kasparian, Kubel, the Ring, Platonov brothers. They're very famous, Platonov brothers. 
Uh, what is it that is so special or why do you, why do you recommend their studies uh, specifically? Uh, I, d I think they just make the best studies. I'm just familiar with those names. There are some other composers as well, but they just from the quantity of the studies that I've done, I just these names pop out, and I usually like those studies. Right. It's something similar that we see here. There's an unusual idea with a self steel mate, but you will see a different ideas. You will learn them. You know, under promotion idea, you will learn in some examples. So. I, w I would go with like a big names because their studies will be more instructive. Yeah, like Kasparian. Kasparian, <laughs> Pervakov is the one that currently is very popular, Pervakov studies. Right. And also, uh, wow, you're quite a regular at the Tradewise Gibraltar Chess Festival. This is, you were saying it's that you've been here? Yeah, it's a fifth or sixth. Yeah, I was here last year. And yes, uh, and you had a fantastic uh, tournament. I had a great tournament last year. I had uh, finished seven out of ten, uh, uh, no losses, four wins, plus four. And... Um, uh, I was playing Fabiano Caroni in the last game and it was a very long game and I was defending and then maybe I was even better but it ended in a draw. So I finished uh, with plus four uh, in a very strong company with Peter Swidler, Caruana, it was some very strong players. So it just show, shows how strong this tournament is. Yeah. You know, that you know, have such a elite players just, just getting seven out of ten. It's just very difficult. I like the atmosphere of this tournament. It's I think the most fun open tournament. It's just uh, it's a really nice atmosphere. The organizers are doing a good job and uh, you know, bringing you know, players. And it seems like a, a lot of regular players here. I think there are some people who played maybe in every, every edition of the event. So this is my fifth or sixth right. event. I really enjoy coming here and uh, uh, to play some very strong players as well. And uh, you're on five out of seven. Are you... I mean, you must be happy with the way things are going so far. I wasn't very happy before this game, to be honest. I've had a bit of a frustration. Last three days, three draws, long games. Mm. I had a seven and a half hour game, 105 moves. I held a draw. Then I held another draw. And yesterday I was pressing for a long time and I couldn't win. So it was a bit of a frustration. So I needed this win to get into a better mood and uh, hopefully have a strong finish. So. Yeah, also the quality of today's game was fantastic. Yeah, it was a good game. Yeah, it makes me happy. I mean, you can win games. I mean, we win a lot of games, but when you win a good game and uh, without like an, you know, he it wasn't very obvious where he went wrong. I mean, it was a bit suspicious this night be trading, but overall, I think, you know, my ideas were... You know, lots of tricks. Lots of tricks. And, you know, being able to calculate precisely until the end where the night actually got dropped. So three more games to go. We'll see. Yeah. yeah. Well, do we have any more questions from the audience? Yes. And the Camino Race is coming to Norway in a couple of weeks. Yes. To play Fischer Rando. Yes. Who do you think is going to win the match? Oh, this is very interesting. Yeah, I'm I, just going to yeah. read yeah. it for our online yeah, yeah, audience. Yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, Nakamura, he's going to have the Fischer Rando match. Yes, uh, against Magnus, yeah. Uh, against Magnus, yeah. And uh, what's your opinion of that? Who, who are yeah, you rooting I, for? Who do you think is going to win? I think it's going to be very exciting because I heard it's like unofficial world championship, right? Yeah. Something like this. So it's going to be like a big event. Uh, I'm not sure how... I, I know uh, Carlson does really well in the official random games when they play on chess.com. But I'm going to go with Hikaru on this one because I think he's more experienced. And he de defeated Lewon in a official random match in St. Louis a couple of years ago. And uh, I, I feel like this is his... Uh, you know, he can do well in this one, but I'm not sure because we don't know so much about Carlson's uh, Fisher Random. So uh, I, I know he, he has some experience playing, but I think uh, I'll go f for Hikaru in this match. Not sure the format, the time control is. That, that actually makes a difference too, how many games they play in the time control. But uh, I think Hikaru is going to do well. Talking about Hikaru, he's your, uh, I mean, you've known him for many years and uh, you know him really well. What is it that uh, that makes him so strong in open tournaments? I mean, he's uh, yeah. he's an absolute beast. Yes, in open events, he's, events. He's, this is just his type of tournaments. And also, uh, I know he won this tournament several times, but also, let's not forget, he won this very strong millionaire tournament with a very big prize one as well. And he's just very good. He's like Carlson when it comes down to playoffs. He almost never loses a playoff. Uh, maybe he's never lost a playoff. I don't know. I can't even think of because... In even that millionaire tournament, he had to yeah. go to this qualifier playoff first to qualify to the final four, and then he ended up beating every opponent in that as well. So I think his style is a very difficult opponent to play. I think uh, maybe against the very, very top players, when he plays them all the time, it's, it's not as easy, but against people below him, 
I think he is uh, His style of very play is difficult. very suited yeah. as well. Yeah, and also he can play for a win on demand. Like last year, if you remember, he played Eduard Romain in the last game with Black. Yes. And he had to win. Because he was half point half behind point David behind Anton. Anton and, uh, and Yu Yang Yi won. So, so he had to win, but he could play. He played a very sharp opening in complications. You know, he is a guy who, who can try to make things happen. I mean, I, I, I haven't, I can't think of like open tournaments where he does badly, you know, like I, maybe in some of the elite, super elite events he doesn't do as well, but I think this kind of open tournaments he does Suits really him. well. Yeah. Suits his style, yes. Okay, now Time Traveler wants to know that uh, will you ever play the Dutch defense? Oh, Dutch, I don't know, that's a tough one. It just <laughs> doesn't really suit my style. I don't think I ever played the Dutch defense, you know. I, I might try it. Um, I've tried the Stonewall system. I don't know, that's probably not Dutch though. <laughs> I've played the Stonewall a couple of times, uh, but it's possible maybe I'll try in some Blitz games or something. Why do you say it's not suited to your style? Because I like to control the center. <laughs> so <laughs> if you play the Dutch, you're not really controlling the center too much and you're creating some weaknesses. I try to avoid creating weaknesses early on. So, right. But, you know, some people like it. It's, you know, playable opening. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we had Mickey Adams uh, when we were doing the rapid fire round and we asked them the question, what is the one opening they would never play? I think it was Mickey who said that yeah. he would never play the Dutch. And maybe he had the, because he's also got that similar Yeah, yeah, he's, it's hard so to imagine Mickey play the Dutch. Yeah, he's <laughs> just so, so classical, you know. So it goes against all his principles yeah, yeah. and beliefs. Yeah. Well, great. Do we have any final questions for Warren? So far, you talked the Karpov School of Chess. What do you know about the Karpov School of Chess in the U.S.? Yeah, so yeah. What is it yeah, that you, you can tell us about the Karpov School of Chess? Yes, Karpov School in Chess. It's actually in this very small place called Linsburg, Kansas. That's actually the only chess school Karpov has in the U.S. So it was founded, I think, in 2003 or 2004. Uh, and uh, I've, I've been there uh, many, many times teaching the summer chess camps. And, uh, and in fact, my friend Mark Cobb, who is in the audience, he used to be the president of that school, so he is traveling. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, a very nice, uh, it's a very nice little place where it's, it's a very small place. You would, wouldn't imagine like there would be a chess club there. Wow. So, you know, we, uh, and the summer camps would get like 25 students or something, so we have so good training. Up. There? Yeah. It's really in the middle of nowhere, like <laughs> you really have to... Uh, either have a long drive there or fly and then drive. So it's a uh, location, it's, it's hard to reach. Right. But we would have good uh, turnouts for the summer chess camps. And they have, every summer they have chess camps. Uh, and you go, have you trained there? Or? I, I, I've been training, I haven't done the last uh, few years, but uh, I've been doing that regularly uh, before that, you know, so. Right. Yeah. Anything else from our Twitch audience or anything online? Coming in, do we still have some goals for the future, maybe in playing and or also in coaching? So your goals for the future are my uh, well, I don't have any big goals at the moment, big ambitions or anything. My f my goal is I I actually made a good run last year. I got my rating up to 2680, so I was hoping this might be that breakthrough that I was looking for for a long time. I had a couple of good results, U.S. Championship, then I won another round robin tournament in St. Louis, a strong round robin. So. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that, that's that's the goal. Yeah, that's the goal. Yeah, no, that's the people who know me, who are close to me. They know that that's my goal. You know, to get there, and then from there we'll see. But it's very tough because you know, even if I'm playing here, you just have to be really precise. Just playing a decent game, it's not going to be enough to even beat 2,500 players because nowadays everybody know how to play. Everybody know how you know the openings work. It's you don't get easy wins. You have to work that's really true. hard to get a win, even against like 2,500 opponent. A lot of people actually talk about this inflation that has happened in rating, but actually if you think about it, uh, it's really hard in chess now because the middle level players, the strength of players from even 2100 to 2200 till about 24, 2500 has really gone up from the past. It's much stronger than what it used to be, the ability to defend resources that they find. So, so I, I actually think that chess has become tougher. Oh, absolutely. I mean, before, like five, six years ago, the, the U.S. Open tournaments, I would do really well there and I would win a lot of games, you know, like I would just play well and, you know, effortlessly they would just make mistakes and I would win. But nowadays, it's very tough. You play those U.S. Open tournaments, you're likely to drop rating than actually game because you will play some 22, 2300 players and 
it's not guarantee you're going to win those games. So it's, <laughs> I agree with you. I, I'm, I much rather play a tournament with uh, 26, 50 opponents, all the games, then I just know I'm playing somebody his strength, and if I have a good day, I can win. And it's just, but a lot of times when you play, like the first round I played in this tournament, I'm playing a very young boy from India, he's like 13 years old, 23, 30 rating, mm -hmm. and clearly underrated. And you know, he played really well. I was black, and couldn't do much. The game didn't draw. I mean, frustrating. But what are you <laughs> gonna do? I mean, it's just if he doesn't make a mistake or blunder, I mean, he. I put all the tricks in a king and pawn endgame. He could go wrong and I would win. He just didn't make any mistakes. And their opening preparation as well. Yeah, I mean, I played, he played e4 and I played, tried Karo Khan and he, he knew the theory and yeah. there's not much I can do. I mean, it's really hard to win a chess game nowadays. And then a, a tournament like this is very challenging, no? With so very many youngsters and... Yeah, it's, it's very challenging. Again, I would, it's easier to play, let's say, a round robin tournament yeah. with the people around you already because you have, you know, you don't have to worry about winning every game. So, but, but also this is different because here you have an opportunity to play some very top players because, you know, like players, my rating at the moment doesn't have opportunity to play Levon or MVL or Hikaru on a regular basis, you know. So this is an opportunity to play some of the top guys and you learn a lot from playing them. You can study their games, but actually you learn a lot when you actually play and you see how they play and uh, prepare. Right. Well, thank you so much, War, for this super <laughs> instructive masterclass. Thank you, yeah. That was amazing. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. <laughs>